Welcome everybody to today's webinar. I am Donna Prosser. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. And today we're going to be talking about healthcare data and what data belongs to uh, the patient, what belongs to the organization, how do we use that data to improve, improve healthcare. Um, so we're very excited today to be able to offer continuing education credit for nurses, pharmacists, and physicians uh, through MedStar Health. This CE is only available for those who attend the live webinar today. Um, we have a great panel of speakers today, and none of, the, none of us have any financial relationships to report, and neither does our planning committee. And so today, we're, you know, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about healthcare data, understanding um, you know, what is currently happening in our electronic health records, and both from the clinician and the patient perspective, understand the safety and um, issues and the challenges with that. Um, and then also we're gonna talk about some, some better ways that patients can access their healthcare data. And so we have some fabulous panelists here joining us today. We have Dr. Raj Ratwani from uh, MedStar Health. We've got Martin Hatley, who is uh, with Project Patient Care as well as MedStar Health. Helen Haskell, the president of Mothers Against Medical Error. And Ana Luisa Neves, who's joining us from Imperial College in London. So I'd like to welcome our panelists, and I would love for our panelists to introduce themselves a bit. Helen, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about your background. Well, I'm Helen Haskell. I'm a patient advocate. I came to this through a personal tragedy many, many years ago when my young son died from medical error in a teaching hospital. And... Um, we were so shocked really at what we found when he died that um, I ended up just, it seemed to be sort of a never ending project. And here I am 20 years later, still working on the patient safety project. Um, and transparency has been a big part of that as we'll discuss further along. Excellent. Thank you, Helen, for joining us. Raj, tell us a bit about your background. Hey, thanks, Donna. Well, it's really nice to be here today. Um, so I'm Raj Ratwani. I have two roles at MedStar Health. I serve as the Vice President of Scientific Affairs for the MedStar Health Research Institute and as the Director of the MedStar Health National Center for Human Factors in Healthcare. Uh, and today I'm here to share a lot of our work and thoughts on electronic health records, usability and safety, and what that means for patients. And really my work is um, driven, the whole reason I'm in healthcare is really because of my mother, who's a physician and uh, who's always loved practicing medicine. And, and several years ago, my weekly conversations with her, I, I, she lives in California, I live in Washington, D.C. I call her every Sunday. And she used to always talk about how much she loves practicing medicine and how much she loves caring for her patients in the small community clinic. And that conversation shifted um, as electronic health records were rolled out very much to, I'm spending way too much at night documenting, I'm not as fast as the other physicians, this is too stressful, I wanna leave medicine. Uh, and my background is in human factors and usability. And so I thought, gosh, there's got to be a way that we can try and resolve this. So that really pulled me in uh, and looking forward to talking about that today. So again, great to be here. Oh, and I should warn everybody, uh, working from, from home with two kids, eight-year-old, four-year-old, that are all doing virtual school of some sort, almost guaranteed that they'll come bursting into this room at any moment. So please don't be alarmed if, if kids come sprinting in here. I've warned them, but they're not going to listen. <laughs> Oh, the joys of a pandemic, huh? So, <laughs> thank you, Raj. Thank you so much for being here. Marty. Good morning, Donna and everybody. <clears throat> I'm Marty Hatley. I'm, um, I'm the president of Project uh, Patient Care, which is a small coalition in Chicago that really is dedicated to using the voice of the patient and family um, in improving care. So I think of myself primarily as a patient safety advocate. And within that, you know, pretty large space of, of interest in a lot of issues. I'm really, really interested in um, engaging patients and family members as uh, more complete and more full and more uh, ramped up partners uh, in producing the best outcomes and the, and the best experience for, for patients. So great to be here with you today. And I'm a lawyer by, I'm a lawyer by background. <laughs> All right, um, Anna. I think you're muted, Anna. Classic mute. 
so I'm a research fellow at Imperial College London. So my department works mostly on patient safety. So actually the name of our department is Patient Safety uh, Translational Research Center. And most of my research interests are about digital technologies and how can we use them to actually partner with patients, engage them in the process and improve quality and safety of care. So I, I became actually much more interested on the electronic health records aspect and sharing the electronic health records with patients through portals or other kind of interfaces. And this has been uh, pretty much the focus of my research. I was smiling when I heard Raj's story because I think I have two things in common with the story. So I'm also a family doctor by background and I could share a lot of things that you mentioned about your mother. And I also have twins, which hopefully you won't see because they are back to the nursery, which is a good thing. <laughs> So yeah, that's me. And thanks for the invite. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. I know it's late for you over there in, in London, much later in the day than it is for us here. So thank you. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. We have lots of questions to get to today. Um, I'd like to start first with Helen. Um, Helen, talk to us about you know, what, what data should patients want to have access to? Um, how can we make it easier for, for, for them to know what it is that they should have access to? Well, in my opinion, from my perspective, patients should have access to anything. Yeah. Nothing about me without me. So patients should have access to the entire EMR, especially while they're in the hospital, which is, of course, right now the most difficult time to get it. Um, Plaintree has, has always had that um, philosophy. I don't know exactly what they do um, in Plaintree hospitals, but certainly the idea that patients should have access to their own medical records is a pretty old one. And I think now EMRs are pretty sophisticated. Um, they can generate patient-friendly um, records if they want to. And, and one of the things that I have learned in my years of, of working with patients and providers is that if something is um, comprehensible to patients, then it's also comprehensible to healthcare providers. And the reverse is also true. Often um, people just don't understand things and they don't, of course, want to say that because they're, they feel as though they're supposed to. So having a plain language EMR for patients might well be a benefit for everyone. And I just want to add, I don't want to go on too long, but there's, there are larger things than personal data. So healthcare ratings, infection reporting, for example, which I've been involved with for many years, um, it's limited to a very small number of specific infections, which are no longer really the biggest threats to patients. We need things like hospital-wide infection reports and we need reports on outcomes, long-term outcomes for procedures. And this can all come from real world data and also from patient reporting. I think none of this is gonna work without patient input. So when I started in healthcare 30 years ago, um, you know, it was pretty clear that it was, the hospital felt like they owned the medical record and, and this idea of sharing data with patients wasn't, wasn't something that we did. So, can um, Helen talk a little bit about the background here? When, what, how did this movement get started? You know, it's very interesting. So it started as part of the consumer movement in the 1970s. Um, the patient rights movement was part of the consumer movement. Nader's Raiders is what most of us have heard about from that era. But all of that really sort of transformed our ideas across society about safety and transparency and really link the two for the first time. Um, it, it's just hard to remember that be, people in the 1970s didn't have access to any kind of medical information, including the medical literature. Medical knowledge was a closely held secret. And some of the very first patient groups like the Center for Medical Consumers in New York City started out by creating medical libraries for patients where they could come and look up their conditions. They would even, you know, they would mail people, they'd copy things on a copy machine and mail them to them. Um, getting hold of your own medical record was sort of the flip side of that. Um, people didn't really know when they'd been harmed. Um, and it happened a lot less because there was a lot less medical care going on. Um, as there was more medical care and more knowledge, um, and especially with the internet, which sort of blew everything wide open. Um, 
people naturally want to know more about what was going on with their own care. But it, it's never been easy to get hold of your own record. It's taken really the recent actions by the federal government to make it clear that patients do have access to their records. But there are often still issues. There, you know, medical records are scattered across various departments. If there's harm involved, providers aren't necessarily keen to have patients see all their records. We still have a long way to go. Marty, I know you've been working in this space for a long time. What do you, anything else to add to, to that? Yeah, it's interesting to me to hear you, Donna, and, and Helen talk about uh, who owns the medical record, because from a legal point of view, there's, it's pretty established that the patient owns their medical record. And the struggle uh, in the courts usually, and it's usually in the context of a, of a professional liability suit, is getting access. So ownership has been kind of honored by the law, but there's been a tolerance uh, of, um, of quote unquote reasonable restrictions on access. And often that uh, came about as you would be charged a lot by your doctor to see your medical record. So they would charge you $5 a page uh, something like that, that you know, would strike most of us as unreasonable when there was a copy machine right around the corner. But anyway, the, the legal principle is clear. And then I think um, the real issue has been access. And um, I don't really think of it as, as driven primarily by the consumer movement. So Helen, I learned something from you. I think of it really as being driven by the patient rights movement, which is an extension of the human rights movement that you know, we're entitled to information about our bodies. We're entitled to, to be the decision makers about our bodies. And that goes back really to, um, you know, a lot of the uh, ethical work after World War II about who owns our bodies and who, who's entitled to information about them. Well, I wonder if you can also then talk about open notes. There um, are some folks on the line who might know about that, might not. Just tell us a little bit about that. Well, open notes is an a it's an approach it's an approach um, that really you know at its very um, um, simple level is to provide complete access to all of the medical records everything that Helen wants open notes is the approach that would that would give you access to your complete medical record and it's also um, a movement so there's been a lot of thinking about this since the 70s uh, when I think the first articles were published saying that people should have um, access to their medical records, not only uh, to improve safety and quality, but to improve the physician-patient relationship um, that will be stronger and to empower people, uh, patients to become um, people who can actually do something about the rights that we're now acknowledging that they have. So it's, it's a movement and it's also a really uh, sort of well-organized organization. Uh, OpenNotes.org has uh, a lot of current information um, easily explainable to people where, if, if you want to learn more about it. So it's, it's all those things, but basically the concept is really simple. And that is we, we have a right to our records and we're going to make those records more and more accessible. And by records, I mean everything. I mean, including the clinician notes, the progress notes. Those are the things that have traditionally been thought of as sensitive. Would the patient understand them? Do we really want the patients to know what we're saying about them? And that's being driven by transparency. Um, Donna, though, if I can add, Open Notes doesn't do that yet. Um, I think that is the goal, but Open Go Notes has been very incremental in their approach. So their, um, their Our Notes um, program, which is the patient sharing program, is really sort of an agenda setting by the patient. The patient submits information and then the providers decide whether they want to include that in the record. So it's, it's sort of like a um, be prepared. Med, that's a program at AHRQ that MedStar was created. Um, and there are others too, just a, sort of a, a way to, to talk better to your doctor. Um, but it, it's interesting to me, you know, when this started, there was a lot of opposition. Um, the doctors were opposed, the patients all loved it. There was actually a 99% approval rating from patients, which I've never seen anywhere else in medicine. Um, and 90% of them wanted an extended to hospital stay. So clearly this is something that patients want. I, I remember meetings as early, as late as maybe 10 years ago, where the topic of the conversation would be, um, oh my gosh, can you imagine what patients would say if they actually saw their records, <laughs> if they actually saw what we write about them? And I think um, 
you know, it is, Helen, I agree, it's, it's more, it's, it's a call to action. It's, it's, it's a movement in the sense that there's not everybody sort of agreeing on the details, but they're all agreeing on the direction. And sort of at the more extreme end of that is um, propositions that we're hearing more and more about, about patients actually being able to add to their records or to correct their records or to make notes themselves in their records. So there is kind of sort of a range of pieces to it that are all still in development, I think. Or many of them are still in development. And, and, and until you have that, I think, you know, that's when you will get accuracy, when you can have patients adding to the records. <clears throat> and correcting. I mean, I think uh, we're already seeing the literature emerge where if you do have access, uh, people are finding um, the errors that we in the patient safety movement know are, are pretty routine in a system as complex as healthcare is and as complex as record keeping in healthcare is. That's right. Empowering patients is, uh, is safe for everyone. So. Um, Raj, you have a, you got a campaign there at MedStar Health called the EHR See What We Mean campaign. I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that and what the impact for, uh, of that campaign is on patient safety. Yeah, absolutely. We'd be happy to. So uh, if people are not familiar with it, I highly encourage you to check it out. You can go to ehrseewhatwemean.org. Um, and really the campaign is about bringing greater transparency to electronic health record usability and safety. And we launched the campaign in February of last year, which marked the 10 year anniversary of really the big um, legislative act to promote the use of electronic health records. So that was passed way back in 2009. And over the course of, you know, from, if you look at from 2009 to today, we've moved to nearly every healthcare facility in the United States using electronic health record, 90 plus percent that use an electronic health record. And what people probably don't realize, because you're, you're probably not thinking about this every day, nor should you be, is that the, the way these electronic health records are designed and the way that they're implemented um, and used can actually facilitate a whole host of really terrible errors that impact uh, our care. And so we see errors where wrong patients are being selected out of the chart and then medications are ordered for them or procedures are ordered for them. Um, wrong weights are documented on our children. And then that means that when they're prescribed a medication and most children's medications are based off of their weight, that means they're gonna get an overdose of medication. And we've just done study after study on this and found these really poorly designed electronic health record systems that are leading to errors. And the campaign really was sparked because in the contracts, at least historically in the contracts between electronic health record vendor companies that develop these systems and the hospitals and other healthcare facilities that buy them were something called gag clauses. And these clauses actually explicitly prevented, forbid the sharing of screenshots and examples of these errors, which we thought was just horrific. I mean, if you look at any other aspect of medicine, medication errors, medical devices, you name it, there's incredible transparency and there's databases to collect those issues so that we can fix them. And that has not been the case with electronic health records. And so the campaign, and again, if you go on the website, you'll see very explicit videos of actual physicians using the electronic health record and the challenges that they face. So for example, one of, one of my favorite ones to cite is we have a physician, uh, emergency physician that's trying to order Tylenol, pretty basic medication to order. They type in Tylenol to search for the medication in the electronic health record. They get 86 different options back. And it's, they're trying to place a medication, they're trying to place the Tylenol order for a, a young male, 22 year old male. They get children's Tylenol examples, infant Tylenol, Tylenol for women, uh, all kinds of things in those 86 options. So why, why do we care? Why does that matter? Well, imagine if that's the kind of interface and system you're using for a 10 hour shift there's such a huge likelihood that they're going to select the wrong medication. Now, thankfully, with something like Tylenol, it's pretty low risk. But when you start thinking about all the other medications and procedures that they order, of course, errors are going to happen and they're going to select the wrong thing. And that has very, very serious implications for patients and patients have actually died because of some of these issues. So the goal of the campaign is to heighten awareness of these kinds of issues. Thankfully, the Office of National Coordinator that oversees electronic health records in the United States has moved to remove those gag clauses, um, but the work's not done. We now need to have a central reporting system for these. And 
this goes back to the central conversation around making sure patients have access to their records. One of the critical things that we tell patients is we know that these errors are going to happen because of the design of electronic health record and patients are a critical line of defense to make sure that the information in the record is accurate. And so I always tell folks, check the most basic information, check the demographic information, check to make sure that it's actually you, that it has the right age, the right weight, that the procedures in there and the medications are actually yours because people will be shocked as to how many times incorrect information gets placed in the record. And it may persist in the record. The, our clinicians who are all well-intended and doing their best, the, the, the records are so dense that they simply may not see that wrong information is there. And then at some point in your care trajectory, they may look back at that information and make the wrong decision because that information was never supposed to be there to begin with. So that's sort of the gist of the campaign. And, and again, the big next step here is really making sure that we can find a way to capture all of these safety issues into a central database so that we can analyze them and improve the system. And you know, it's worth noting that, that we're not, this is not about, this is not anti-EHR. You know, if, if, if you think about where we are in terms of technology and you look across domains, uh -oh. it's a no brainer that we need electronic health records in medicine. And if you talk to physicians and nurses and other clinicians and you say, do you wanna go back to paper? The majority of them would say, no, there are tremendous benefits to this technology. But what we need to do is we need to optimize this technology and make sure that it's safe for everybody. So that's, that's the big challenge ahead of us. Um, there's several positive things that are happening, but that's certainly the big thing, the big challenge ahead of us is, is making sure that these EHRs are properly designed and implemented to ensure safe care for everybody. Donna, can I weigh in here on, on this question too? Because I am a huge fan of Raj's campaign. Uh, and I know it's not just your campaign, Raj, but it's a campaign you. you put together. So EHR, see what we mean. Go to that website. And one of the many reasons I'm a fan of it um, is that um, Raj is walking the talk of engaging patients and families. So we're not only talking about them getting access to their own records and, you know, and all of the areas that they're going to find, how they're going to help us make those records better. But he's also engaging them politically uh, through a, a request to write your congressman, you know, uh, get get um, educated about this. Let your elected officials know how important this was to you, because with all due respect to the ONC, they didn't move that fast on this. They, they needed some prompting. And these gag clauses were really, really um, aggressively enforced that he's talking about. I mean, it was that they were that there were threats. Uh, if you share the error that you found in our system with anyone else but me, the vendor, then uh, we're going to go after you legally. And that, of course, allowed the vendors to charge every client. So you would learn from one client who your where your problems were, and then you would charge other clients to share that knowledge with them. And that is just completely anathema to the spirit of a systems approach to safety, which is you know spreading lessons learned as rapidly and as extensively as we can. So it's a brilliant campaign and, um, and a great website. Well, thank, yeah, thanks, Marty. I, I really appreciate that. And, and, and Marty's always been so supportive. And I think you know, as soon as he starts talking, it gets me fired up again about the whole thing. And you know, keep in mind that this was a, it was a $40 billion US tax investment, right? So, so that's all of us here. Um, well, we, I won't make any political jokes, but most of us are paying taxes and um, those taxes are going to pay for, for these systems, yet we can't make the improvements to them. And, and, and Marty's exactly right, is these clauses have been in those contracts for a very, very long time. And the other, the other clause that is, um, that is noteworthy and needs to be removed, but still persists, is the hold harmless clause. So that essentially says, if a patient is harmed because of an issue related to the electronic health record, the electronic health record vendor, the company that produced the, the electronic health record, cannot be held liable for that. And that's nuts, right? And, and, and what it should be is we have to go back and we have to look at how that issue emerged. And if, that, if the vendor was responsible or partially responsible, they need to be held responsible. If it was the healthcare facility that made a change to the system and that's what resulted in harm, then that entity needs to be held responsible. So that's, that's the, next, um, the next big push for, for sure is, is 
is trying to start tackling that hold harmless clause. One more word and then I'll, I'll stand down. But the other place where we really have to be working on gag clauses is in the settlement of professional liability claims because that's the other place where they're used so extensively. So just think about it. You're, you, uh, you, you've litigated over a problem with care, a breach in the standard of care allegedly. You've come to a settlement and then we gag the family from being able to talk about it. And it's the same principle. If we if we don't talk about our mistakes uh, and learn from them, then we repeat them. I mean, we, we are actually, we're putting fuel on the, on the fire of them getting repeated from place to place to place that haven't heard about as early as they could have. And there are amazing case studies of just problems that have emerged in healthcare, you know, at different facilities around the country that stay quiet for years and years and years because of these gag clauses. So um, it's, it's a bigger principle, uh, but one where we're getting some traction with um, EHR, so what we mean, go to the website. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Um, Anna, I'd love to have your perspective from the international community. Raj just talked a lot about some of the issues that we're facing here in the United States. Can you talk to us about the, the um, user issues that you're having um, and whether or not you have any challenges like, like what Raj was talking about here with the ONC. So, so I think actually they are quite similar to the challenges. And one of them from the physician perspective, as Raj was saying, of course, is the user friendliness of the system. Sometimes it's just too complicated to find or to prescribe a given treatment or to prescribe an exam or whatever it is in the list. But it's also a problem with interoperability because quite often as a GP or as a secondary care doctor, you need to open two, three or four different softwares to do three or four different actions. Let's say I open a window to enter my patient notes and I enter another window to do a prescription and the pop-up to stratify the risk of cardiovascular disease. So it's, it's actually quite a burden and actually family doctors and, general, and secondary care physicians actually state this very loud and they say sometimes it's just such a burden to tick all these boxes that we don't really have the time and the energy to focus on the patient. And they actually say we spend more time looking at the computer or at the screen than at the patient. So this is a big issue. And of course, it has huge implications in communication, patient-doctor relationship, etc. So, so, so the challenges are quite similar from the usability uh, from, from the user side in what concerns physicians. Um, I guess. I, I think it's also important. I really uh, like one of the points that were raised before about the safety implications of this. Because of course, if a doctor is tired, he's not going to register things as he should maybe, or maybe some information is going to be lacking there because there's no time to tick all these boxes. Um, and of course, this has direct implications in the patient safety of this patient in front of us. But uh, nowadays we have actually higher implications because as you know, all these data from electronic health records are more and more being used uh, for studies to stratify risk, to predict risk, and to generate knowledge based on that. So one of the big issues is that actually electronic health records and the data contained there have a lot of quality issues. And we are using data sets with quality issues that we fully acknowledge to generate conclusions and to apply these um, to general populations. So, so I think that's actually a second layer of complexity in what concerns patient safety. And um, I don't think there's a way back there because we just understood the potential of these data sets, but I think there should be a huge drive uh, to find strategies to mitigate these quality issues because otherwise we'll be impacting patient safety in too many levels really. Um, so that's from the user perspective. Uh, I also think that from the patient perspective, uh, in what concerns uh, usability of patient portals or other facing interfaces. I think in Europe, we have mostly two problems. Uh, one problem is about information, as Ellen said before. So, so classically, uh, medical records or medical, or medical notes are not written for the patient. They are written for the doctor themselves. So we are not really trained, and I think this is something that will change and must change. As doctors, we are not trained to write patient notes that are understandable to the patient. We write things that are understandable for ourselves and for our peers. And I think the more and more we understand that patients are part of the process, they will read it, they will contribute, they will check errors, they will amend them if possible. Uh, I think the more we get uh, aware of these, uh, the more we need to actually adjust the way we write patient notes so that our writing actually aligns with this overall culture. And, and I think that there's an issue with information and with patient notes that needs to be adapted with time. 
And, and of course, apart from the information itself, we have the problem with interfaces that sometimes are not very friendly, very intuitive for the patients. And something that we have been discussing quite a lot recently, and particularly in, in our research area, is how do we engage patients and doctors uh, in the design of these interfaces? How do we make the process more interactive? How do we get them back versions of the software so that they can contribute, send their comments back, and we can adapt these uh, rather than having this top-down approach where someone's in company with a multidisciplinary team, that's fair, but they provide a solution that starts basically, uh, that keeps the same uh, um, and doesn't really evolve. So I think that's something that's quite critical for the future to improve usability, uh, really, to involve patients and to try to have a user-centered design as much as possible. And how do you find the public perception there in Europe? Are, uh, you know, Helen Haskell mentioned that here in the United States, 99% of patients that they wanted to see their information. Is that also true in Europe? Yeah, I think, I think, so actually I wanted to share some results with you. I'm not sharing the screen. I can just give you a, a, a summary. So overall patients want to see their records. But what is also puzzling is that, so we ran a survey. Uh, so it, this is published. I can give you the reference and I can put it in chat, in the chat. So there it was recently, uh, there was a recent survey in the UK and US asking patients, do you know that you could have access to your records and 20% of them didn't know that this was actually a possibility in both settings. So this is a survey, take it with a pinch of salt. I'll share the, re I'll share the link here in the chat and you can read the details. So for me, this is something quite puzzling and tells me that there's a lot of work to do in communication to tell patients actually, there are, there's 20% of patients that doesn't recognize this as an opportunity. So we need at least to try to pass this message as much as possible. Uh, overall, yes, they are willing to, to read the records. Uh, as you said, um, there are different views, as Martin said, actually, there are different views on the details, on whether they should see doctor notes or results. So, of course, results and tests, so this is something that's quite uh, accepted globally. When you start talking about patient notes, even between patients, some patients actually say that um, that could create anxiety. They would like to see a kind of a more digestible summary of the information. And something that I find really interesting, so we got that in one of our recent studies. We asked patients about their experience reading the notes and they said, I'm okay about reading the notes. I'm okay about reading the results, but I would like to have some kind of explanation of what do these results mean. Because what's happening here in the UK, for instance, is that sometimes some providers actually send you a text message or saying, just check your website because we have test results there. So as a patient, you go there and you see something like liver function tests abnormal or outside of normal range. And for a patient, this can be really, distress, uh, uh, really stressful because they don't know if this slightly high value is something really bad or is something that's kind of normal. So, so just plugging the information um, sometimes is not enough. And for some groups of patients, they would like to see an extra layer of uh, information so they, they could interpret these a little bit better. So, um, so I think as Martin said, overall, yes, there's support. We all agree that that's direction, but we might not all agree in the details, really. Interesting. Well, Marty, um, I wonder if you can talk to us about the new ONC rule that has just come out for, uh, here in the United States about data sharing. Um, Donna, I can try. <laughs> uh, there, there is a new rule uh, that uh, I think has the potential to be very transformative, at least in this country. So I'm really curious, Anna, just as you start, sort of survey the world, where you think are the countries that we should be uh, looking at as leaders, because I'm impressed right now that we are stepping up in our country. And um, this, this new rule came out of something called the 21st Century Cures Act, which was passed in 2016, which was really uh, intended to increase usability and, and interoperability of the electronic healthcare record. So it's not an open notes rule. It's just one that overlaps and, um, and, and frankly brings in a lot of the thinking of the open notes movement. And there's parts of it that are very clear and it, it includes a list of the different kinds of records that patients and family, the patients are going to have access to, must be given access to. And it's a pretty interesting list. It's consultation notes, 
it's uh, discharge notes, it's procedure notes, it's progress notes, all those things that are, where there's some variation in addition to just results, labs and pathologies. Um, there are, um, where it gets confusing is that there's a timeline that looks pretty aggressive in terms of the way the rule actually reads. Uh, and it's supposed to start in November, where uh, what the rule refers to as actors, but think of actors as health systems and those people with access to this information have to start making this information available. But then there's a whole section of the rule that just takes into account COVID and says, you know what, um, here's our timeline, and then there's COVID, so there's going to be some delays in the implementation of the timeline. So the train has left the station, but whether it arrives at its destination on time and, and the stops it's gonna make along the way remain unclear. And then there's a list of exceptions to the rule, certain things that I just can't find detail on yet, and that's where I get really confused. So there's an exception for things that are sensitive information like psychotherapy notes, uh, there's an exception for um, information about that's generated in anticipation of litigation. But there's other things that are just kind of, uh, in fact, Adam mentioned one of them. Um, will, will providing access uh, to, the, to the records uh, actually create harm for the patients? So one would hope that would be a very narrow exception. Perhaps um, where we see that mostly in law is when we're dealing with children. Is really do children have access uh, to, should, should they have access to all the things that we're writing about them. But those things are going to have to be worked out. There's also, um, you know, some wiggle room for cost, how much we can charge for this for um, technology to be able to do it. But the goal, ultimately, the station, if we will, that we're, we've left the station, the arrival station is really complete access across all devices for patients and families, including smartphones. So that's where it feels really transformative to me that we're gonna have in these you know, supercomputers we all carry around in our pocket now, at least in, in my country, um, pretty easy access when this is fully realized to our information in a way that really is usable by us. And the, um, I also just wanna say the, the, the best place I, I can see for tracking the, the rule is the Open Notes website. There's an infographic there about the timeline. It's, it's not a clear uh, uh, timeline to me, but there is information there that's, that's updated rapid, uh, uh, in real time. Raj? If I could just quickly jump in, I think you know, Marty summarized that really nicely. And the other important um, part of that 21st Century Cures Act legislation that the ONC is really uh, pushed for and is a great thing is, is the, uh, the idea of application programming interfaces, so APIs for short. And uh, all of us, whether you know what they are or not, we've all experienced them. So if you're searching for, uh, uh, when we used to fly around you know, the world, when you were searching for uh, an airline ticket, instead of having to go to every airline's website, you could go to a central hub, you could go to kayak.com, you could go to Travelocity, and what those websites do is they're using these APIs to ping those different airlines' websites and source all that information into one place. So why is that important for us as, as patients? Well, what the 21st Century Cures Act and the ONC has done is said those APIs have to be enabled for electronic health records for a certain subset of information, and that information will continue to evolve and grow over time. So that becomes really important for this conversation for multiple reasons. What that's gonna allow us to do is to have new tech companies come in and develop new apps, just like we have on our, on our smartphones, that are gonna potentially resolve a lot of these usability and safety issues that we've been talking about with the electronic health record. And those apps would be accessible by patients so that they can look at their data in a different way. So for example, if I wanna look at my, I use running apps, I like to run a lot. So if I wanna look at my blood pressure levels and my other patient information in conjunction with my running data, somebody could build an app to do that. And they could source the data directly from my record. Similarly, if I want help managing diabetes, somebody could build an app that would do that and would directly source information from the electronic health record. So that becomes really, really powerful. It, it starts to um, solve this issue of EHR usability and it starts to get more data into patients' hands. But the risk with that is as soon as you have a third party company come in and build one of these apps, I'm sure everybody reads those legal agreements whenever they download an app. You know, the ones that have like 11 point, 10 point, 8 point, 6 point font and multiple pages. And we usually just click agree to everything because we just want to use the app. Well, embedded in there, 
is what that app developer gets to do with your data. And so now as we start thinking about how this unfolds, download an app that allows this, this new company to access my health information because I want help managing my diabetes. But in that legal agreement, it might say, oh, by the way, Raj, we get to use your data for all these other purposes. We get to sell your data. We get to share your data, et cetera. So it's a really positive thing because it's going to help resolve a lot of these issues. But it also opens up this new challenge of really ensuring that patients are aware of what's happening to their data with all of these apps. And that actually, I think, is, is not too difficult to solve if we get our act together and come up with a standardized form that basically says, here's how your data is going to be used and here's what's going to happen. It, it'll probably take us years to do that, but that's, that's where we have to go. If, if I might jump quickly there. If that's okay. I think that's a very important point, and it's actually quite a discussion right now here. So, so it's 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 broadly accepted that patients should have access to their data, their own the data. But the more these apps are coming, and they are already happening, um, the more the debate goes around what is happening to this data and whether it will be shared with third parties. And I think, again, that's an aspect in which is really important to listen to the patients again. So, so the experience that we have here, and I'm talking just in the UK, I don't know the reality specifically on these on other countries, but here in the UK, uh, most of the studies show that up to 95, 98% of the patients say, please do use my data anonymized for whatever they consider greater good. If you want to use it for research, if you want to use it to find what works better, what kind of treatments, what patients would do best with a given treatment, et cetera. So most of the patients are fine, use it. If they are anonymized, you can use it for that. Once you raise the, um, the problem that this is potentially shared with third parties with potential commercial interests and possibly they can be monetized to generate profit. Of course, acceptance rates, acceptance rates fall to 20, 30%. So I think this is a very, very interesting area. I think we'll hear a lot on that in the next years slash decade. And again, I think it's a point that we should uh, really discuss with patients and try to hear what they say. And as Raj said, I think whenever this comes an issue, this just needs to be said upfront and very clearly to patients. So this is your data, this is for how long we'll store it, and these are the people that might potentially uh, have access to it. And of course, they, they have a say there, really. So Donna, if yeah. I can also add something. Um, so my, my perception of this rule, uh, to take a slightly different tactic, is really mainly focused on interoperability um, between institutions. And there are, um, while that's a, a great thing in a lot of ways, there are also concerns there because as we've been discussing, records are inaccurate. They're often wildly inaccurate. And um, if you get an inaccuracy in a record, a significant one, it can follow the patient um, wherever they go if you have interoperability. So there are a lot of patients like people with chronic diseases who have, um, who really fear interoperability. So I think, again, this is, you know, I hate to sound like a broken record, but this is where you need patient input, including corrections. I mean, by correction, I would say, you know, addition. But um, it, it really is the patient input that will, that will make these things work and make them helpful uh, and make sure you don't have that sort of Damocles hanging over people's heads. And then the other thing that, um, you know, the, the list of, um, of things that are available to patients that Marty cited. So I've been, you know, trying to figure out this, this rule as well. And one of the things that I would say is that previously patients had access to all their, all their information with the exception of psychotherapeutic records, which um, I think Open Notes is trying to address in a different way. But, um, but in general, you know, I think there is a possibility that in this giant flow of text, we'll end up limiting the information that's available to patients. And that's something that we really need to, to watch out for. There's been a rule against withholding data from patients for a long time, but it's never been really enforced. Um, I, I, there are just almost no cases that I know of. I know of a couple where HIPAA violations in the US 
um, have been um, where hospitals have been cited or doctors for failing to give patients their records. Thank you, Helen. Um, I wonder if you can kind of take us into the final stretch here. I'd like to ask each of you to give me your final thoughts. Uh, you know, what, what do you see as the, the broad long-term goal for data sharing and what do you think we need to do to get there? So Helen, I'll start with you. Um, well, you know, I think I was um, thinking about what Marty had said earlier about the human rights movement. I just want to sort of go back. I think the consumer movement is, is part of the human rights movement and, the, and part of the patient rights movement. They're all intersected with this um, the idea that has gradually grown over the course of the 20th century and hopefully now the 21st as well, that, that people really are autonomous and, um, and have rights. But again, the consumer movement, looking at it from that angle, um, which is sort of a practical angle of how do you get this information? We've always focused on how do you get improvement? We've always focused on transparency. Uh, you can't necessarily, we're not medical experts, but we can keep an eye on our own care and, and what's going on in healthcare facilities. Um, and people now have the you know, ability to learn a lot about their own conditions and about what can and should be done in safety and quality. So people are part of the team, patients are part of the team and they can potentially contribute a lot. Um, and if you pull back a little bit, I think the potential for patient level data is really enormous. So there are any number of studies that have indicated that patients can contribute valuable data to their own records, um, and that it's often more accurate than information that's been filtered through the provider, and that's the standard way we put it in the records now. But right now, the main way for patients to contribute data is through patient-reported outcome measures. Those are pros or PROMs. But most of the PROMs are still pretty restricted by the notions of what a patient is supposed to know. So they don't really include the patient's opinion or their thoughts, but just sort of raw data on functionality. Um, there are a lot of people who are really aware of the need for better PROMs, and I'm hoping they will be forthcoming soon. Um, I'll just say that you know, one of my favorite researchers is a doctor named Ethan Bosch from North Carolina who's followed oncology patients for years, and he has found that patients whose chemotherapy was adjusted in accordance with their own reports of side effects live significantly longer lives than those who got standard treatment. And this is, you know, this is really groundbreaking, right? But it, how widely applied is it? I don't know of anyone else who's doing it. I'm not in the world of oncology, but um, I don't hear much about this. And then if you take it up a level, you get big data, so accumulated patient records, what, what we were just talking about, which are now being used for all sorts of other purposes that don't necessarily benefit patients. But at the same time, these have the potential to tell us more than anything about safety and quality and the effectiveness of medical care. And there may be people who are sort of vest, have sort of vested interest in not looking too closely at effectiveness, but what medical treatments work? You know, what facilities are safe? Uh, studies, even, even large studies are often written in a way that look at pretty narrow topics and that can be written in a way to provide sort of desirable results. And I think big data, including patient reported information, and for that matter, provider reported information on safety issues, aside from um, the official information, those things can really provide a foil to uh, the limitations of studies, real world data. That's my spiel. Thank you, Helen. I appreciate it. We do have a few questions, but I'd like to get everybody else's final thoughts before we, we jump in there. Raj, how about you? Great, thanks, Donna. I'll be I'll be really brief. So just two, you know, two things from my side. The first is um, now that we've made the tax dollar investment to digitize medicine and we have electronic health records in place, um, there's, there's so much opportunity with the apps and so many other different pieces of technology that are evolving. And that world moves really, really, really fast. 
I mean, incredibly, incredibly fast. And so as patients, we all have to stay on top of this and we have to get involved in one way or another. And so we spent a lot of time talking about these ONC rules. Well, when these ONC yeah. rules are first proposed, they're up there for public comment. And I, you know, I know for sure, because I've read them, that the electronic health record vendor companies and everybody else is commenting. Um, but my bet is the 73 attendees or 71 attendees that we have now on this call, I'd be shocked if you know, anyone else other than Marty and Helen responded to comments. And so we have to mobilize and get together and be commenting on that legislation because we're the ones that are going to be impacted by whatever is formulated. So that's, that's kind of critical point one. And then the second one is, it's, it's always shocking to me. I'll, I'll talk to um, friends and colleagues and I'll always, when we're talking about this issue, I'll always say, well, you know, how often do you check your financial data? And most of them will say, oh, gosh, all the time. Like sometimes I log into my online bank account daily just to make sure everything's there, at least weekly. And I'll certainly look over my credit card statements. And then I'll say, well, how often do you look at your health data? And they'll look at me like, I, you know, just landed here from the moon. It just is like, what are you talking about? What do you mean look at my health data? Why would I need to do that? How do I do that? It's just shocking. And so we, we have to build that into our behavioral norms. And I think the financial industry is such a good model for us because I can log into whatever number of bank accounts. I can also pull those all into one place. There are websites that offer that. I can also, you know, transfer money to Anna in pounds in minutes. Um, so that's interoperability, that's safety, that's checking our data, that's access, all already solved in the financial industry. So I would just encourage people to think about these other domains and what's happening there, and then ask themselves, why can't healthcare be that way too? And what behaviors am I using with those other domains that I should also be using for myself in healthcare? And I'll stop there. Thank you. Wow, what great. I love that analogy. Thank you, Raj. Marty. Uh, it's a huge topic. So what I've, what I've been focused on mostly are the obstacles to getting uh, uh, usable information that's accurate to patients, because I do think it, the, the empowerment potential, which I've already mentioned, is, is huge. And the EHR for me is something that, I've, that I'm, I am worried about because I don't think it was really designed with the best interests of the patients in mind. We say it was. But, but it, it's far from that goal. We've still got a, a lot of work to do there. When I look at it, I think of it as being driven a lot by billing and administrative procedures than really being a patient-centered. And I think this whole movement can help us pull that in the right direction of really making that a tool that's useful for patients and the people who treat us. Um, I am worried about the big data piece, and I also am excited about the big data piece because I think if we can... Again, the potential in the, in the best of all possible worlds is to see data um, um, synergizing from different places to really be something that patients and families can use. And then I'm just really interested in best practices. So as we talk about what needs to be done next, what are the countries or where are the places where you know, <clears throat> accuracy is being paid attention to and, um, and the use and sharing um, form that uh, Raj mentioned is being developed um, and, it, and I, whenever I kind of jump onto the net and try to figure out what's going on around the world I, I find myself um, kind of going to countries that are really celebrating patient engagement and patient empowerment already and that's where you find some of the best um, advocacy about open notes so Scotland for example I don't know what's happening in Scotland but there's just a commitment there at a policy level to fully engage patients and families and and I think that will be another place to watch um, is just countries that are doing that are probably going to be um, a source of some good tool development. So those are my very random thoughts. <laughs> well, thank you, Marty. Uh, and then finally, Anna. So I, I'm not going to repeat what everyone just said, and I completely agree with everything that was said so far. far. Uh, I would say that a different aspect that should be considered consider along patient engagement is actually uh, to measure what do patients want, because there is no proper research on that. We need to actually listen to patients, ask them, what do you want to see, in which format, do you have the skills to assess these, do you have the literacy, general literacy skills, but also the digital literacy skills that you need to do that. And once we get a clear picture, we can 
design strategies to help them or to help those that need and want to engage with the system. And, and I guess an important aspect here is also health equity because we are moving into digital. There's no way back, I assume. And we just need to be uh, very aware that while patient portals and uh, electronic records accessible to patients via uh, websites or other kind of interfaces, they do improve patient safety. We gave several examples. They do improve medication discrep discrepancies. They, uh, they, they reduce the number of errors. This has been documented. But we must be aware that maybe these benefits are just going to be for a small slice of the population. So we need to try to understand who is being left behind and why, and how can we try to support everyone in the same direction? Because what we do not want with all these is to create benefit that is actually entrenching inequities that are already there as well. So that's a final thought on this as well. Very good point, thank you, Anna. Well, we have just a few questions. Um, the first question, Raj, I'd like to direct to you. Um, it's coming from Teresa Gentry. She's talking about um, a situation that happened at MedStar where the, um, the storage company was hacked. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and what, what happened in that situation and what can we learn from that in the future? Yeah, absolutely. So this is an unfortunate incident that's happened to several hospitals uh, across the country where the company that stores health information can be hacked. Um, and sometimes it, uh, this was happening all the time last year, pretty frequently where hospitals were directly getting hacked in those ransomware events. And, um, and so I think, Teresa, and I'm looking at the question here specifically about what are, what's the responsibility of disclosure to patients. So the HIPAA rules here are very clear that that, that, that information needs to be disclosed to patients. In fact, um, for our, one of our children was born um, at a Nova nearby and they were hacked and we just got the letter in the mail uh, that said your, you know, your, your information has been exposed. So the, the uh, HIPAA guidelines are very clear and, and other regulations are very clear about disclosure. And I think Teresa's real question is what about the timeliness of this? The timeliness seems lacking. I'm not aware of the details of the investigations here, but what I can certainly say is that when there is a pending investigation by the FBI, DOJ, that will slow down disclosure. And that's where there can be exceptions to immediate disclosure. Uh, totally out of my out of my wheelhouse, but I have seen that and heard that and seen the policies on that. And it's certainly the case that if there's a federal investigation, which should happen because of a hacking or other incident, that can slow down um, the timeliness of any disclosure to patients. So I'm wondering whether that could be the case here, but I'm not familiar with it. Um, Helen, a question for you. You talked a lot about patients being able to add to their own records. Um, are, and, and one question that we had was related to, to errors that could occur if the patient were to have access. What are your thoughts on or your concerns about patients being able to potentially delete something or, or, or enter something incorrectly? You know, I think that nothing should ever be deleted from the medical record. That's that's my perspective on this. You can you can add. Um, we have a problem with that already. The records that patients receive are often changed, um, and that certainly creates a lot of suspicion. You know, when they've been corrected, and sometimes that suspicion is justified if there's patient harm. Um, now we can use metadata to sort of go back in some records and see um, what the original was. But it, it just makes sense to me that whatever is originally written, you keep that and then you add comments or corrections underneath that. Great. Um, Anna, we have a question from Brazil, um, and so I wonder if maybe you can help us with this. They're saying that uh, most hospitals there are still using physical medical records. They haven't got, gone completely electronic yet. Um, any thoughts on how we can improve data access to patients when there isn't an electronic environment? So, so, so I don't know the reality in Brazil. Uh, I know quite well the reality here in the UK, and I can say, although there was a huge drive to digitize whatever you could. Uh, this was quite successful in primary care. So basically in primary care, everyone is using electronic records. Uh, it was not as successful in secondary care. So the problem uh, in Brazil is not only in Brazil. So here in UK, we have the same problem in secondary care. 
um, so, so there's a process to, to provide access anyway. So there was a process before. So, so as we discussed for 30 years, that is legally slash ethically a knowledge that patient owns the data. So even if it's paperwork, um, there's a process. You can just ask to the hospital um, and they will provide you a copy of the notes, of the exams, etc. There's a, another thing that for me, so I'm originally from Portugal, where everything is free as a patient. You just ask your notes and they'll give it to you and that's done. Uh, here in UK, you do have to pay a fee. And that brings me back to Martin's comment before. Uh, so, so, so that you have an example, myself as a patient, I asked for my patient notes 20 or 30 pages and I had to pay 50 pounds. So, so this is uh, something that for me as a patient is kind of uh, surprising uh, when we all acknowledge that patient owns the data. Um, but in some countries you do still have to pay to have access to the copies. And for me, that is a barrier to access. Um, because for some people might be fine to pay 50 pounds, but for others might not. So, so, so I think that's a barrier to access. Answering your question, um, there are a lot of countries that haven't transitioned completely. Uh, they still have a process, so patients can still access. And I suppose that they might waive the fee if you say you don't have conditions to pay it. So you might possibly still have access to that, even if it's not electronic. Excellent. Well, we are right at eight o'clock. Um, so I want to thank all of our panelists. Thank you so much, Helen, Raj, Marty, and Anna. I appreciate you being here today. Um, and thank you to our audience members. Um, we, are, um, it, we are always available here. If anybody has any additional questions, please send them our way and we can get your answers from the panelists. So um, as always, this will be, our, the recording of this webinar will be available on our website. If you are seeking continuing education credit for this activity, then if you registered with your proper credentials, then you'll receive an email from MedStar with information on how to collect that CE. Again, we can only offer that for the folks who joined this webinar live today. So thank you very much, everybody, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. <laughs>